Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we have a fantastic panel. I just want to introduce quickly, I'm sure everyone knows our panelists, but Melody Hobson from Ariel Investments, also on the board of DreamWorks, chairman of the board of DreamWorks Animation, Richard Lovett, CAA, Les Moonves, CBS, and Jeff Schell, uh, NBC Universal. Now, this has never been a more exciting time for the media industry. And we just saw a little clip about the globalization, but there's also this other big factor going on right now, which is the digitization of the entertainment industry. And I want to start off on this idea of content being king, which is something that Les talks about quite a bit. And CBS just yesterday afternoon reported earnings that beat on both the top and bottom line, massive growth in advertising far beyond anyone's expectations. Um, and so, Les, I hope you could talk to us a little bit about what's driving the value of content right now. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the world has become a very small place. And, and once again, the, the ways we distribute our content are so different. It's rapidly changed over the last 18 to 24 months like I've never seen it before. And as you mentioned, digital is becoming the operative word, and people can get our content whenever they want it, wherever they want it. At the bottom of it all, however, is great content. You know, our watchword is wireless is useless if you're hitless. Meaning, if you got crap, it doesn't matter how good your distribution is, people aren't gonna watch it. But if you have premium content, like we do, like Jeff does, like Richard does, like Melody does, people are gonna watch it, you're gonna be able to sell it. Um, the amount of money we're receiving now for our content all over the world is increasing rapidly, and it's a great time to be in the content business. And it, tell us a little bit about this idea that you're content driven. It's not about you know, filling a, a slot in your schedule, it's about the shows, and selling those shows outside CBS itself. Yeah, well, we, we have a lot of different platforms and a, do, a lot of different types of shows from Showtime to CBS to the CW to syndication. And we like to say we do everything well or as best as we can, whether it's Judge Judy or Billions on Showtime, it's all done well. Um, and at the end of the day, it used to be CBS was a front end company. By that I meant oh, the only thing that matters was rating and advertising. Now advertising is less than 50% of our business. So having this great content to be able to sell all over the place domestically as well as internationally has really changed the face of our business. So that's why we call ourselves a content company first and foremost. Now, of course, um, we're coming off this huge news of NBC Universal buying DreamWorks Animation. So this panel could not be at a better time <laughs> with better panelists. Um, Jeff, tell us a little bit about the acquisition and how it fits into your content strategy. We did the deal to make the panel more interesting. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> So, uh, no, I, I actually, well, I, I, I said I was going to disagree with the first thing Les said, but I actually agree, unfortunately, with what, everything he said. <laughs> the world, in a place where you can watch, you know, two things happening, as you saw in the video at the beginning, you can watch content wherever you want it in the world at any time on whatever device you want it. Um, if I'm home, I can watch Billions, which I love, by the way, on, on, my, on my DirecTV or cable provider, but I have you know, Time Warner anywhere and DirecTV anywhere, and I can watch it outside of the house too. And that's changing the whole nature of the media business from one that's, con you know, platform driven to one that's content driven. And I think, you know, what DreamWorks has, and Melody and, and her board and her company have been able to do in, in the years building that company, it is, about, um, it is about content. They have some of the most recognizable content that kids have grown up with over the past two decades. And, and, uh, and they have a, um, a incredible brand that they've built. And for us as a company that's looking to build content across multiple platforms, it fit the best with our company and we felt we'd be the best custodian for what they had built. Now, Melody, you've talked about this idea that not all content is created equal. There aren't that many assets out there like a DreamWorks animation. No, and you and I talked about that offline and I said, really, there are only a few jewels. And we did a study at DreamWorks on just our brand and name recognition. And we looked at it globally. And we were amazed to see that we ranked up there with some of the best known brands in the world, literally, like Apple, like Coca-Cola, et cetera. We weren't as high as they were, but we were in the same sphere with them. And that said a lot to us. And there are very few companies that can say that. 
we believe, and I do believe, there were just a couple of really, really great properties. Obviously, Pixar was picked up by Disney. Lucasfilm, which I know a little bit about, was picked yeah. up by Disney. And then you had DreamWorks. And it's not to say there aren't other valuable brands out there, but truly in terms of true global brands, those three you know, are very high, rank very highly versus the next few that come after them. So that was something that I think made a real difference. I think especially when it comes to children, when parents see that logo, they know what kind of quality and what they can expect from it. And for a parent, that's really, really important. So what do you think the key differentiator is? What is it that allows some of those brands to be head and shoulders above everyone else? And, and you mentioned some of these studies. Do you think it's it's the, the kid-friendly content, these family brands? I think kid-friendly, but I think specifically for DreamWorks, our company and our, our movies, and then ultimately our TV shows have a personality. They were always a little irreverent, um, and I think that's something that the, the humor played to both parents and children simultaneously. And sometimes the, the joke was funny to the child, even if, though they didn't know why the joke was as funny as it is. And so that was something that brought the whole family into the movie. You know, people talk about four quadrant films. We have a lot of examples of that where a teen would want to see our movie, a child would want to see a movie, an adult would want to see our movie, someone would want to go on a date and see one of our films, and yet they were animated films seemingly just for children. So I think that all fed into this idea of what the brand and what you could ex expect from it. And ultimately, that ended up being extraordinarily valuable. We weren't trying to be, and we are not, I, I don't want to talk in past tense if we don't, as if we don't exist anymore, but we are not trying to be all things to all people. We really do stand for something very specific, and obviously the humor and the heart in our films is, I think, ultimately what carried through and allowed us over 22 years to build the brand that we were able to build. So, Richard, as, a, as an agent representing filmmakers and actors, um, what do you see in terms of the shift in what's valuable in content right now? Um, I don't know so much about uh, the shift in what's valuable, but uh, I love this panel so far because I haven't had to speak yet, which is great because <laughs> it's a bit nerve-wracking for me uh, on my debut panel. But, but it, it, everyone along the panel here is, uh, is reliant on one thing, and, and there is one uh, element of this that is the, the, in the ecosystem that is the most scarce of all elements, and it's not money, and it's not di distribution, it's, it's talent. And it is the, the to to echo what what everyone has said. The content is 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 king, and talent creates that content. And therefore, uh, I would argue that the talent is the most important, scarce, and 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 necessary element in the equation. So, uh, the crown jewel of DreamWorks was Shrek, uh, uh, along with one other yeah, one of them, uh, top three, and we represented. Shrek, the underlying material, and Mike Myers, who created uh, it through all kinds of trial and error, that incredible voice and made the indelible character of Shrek. Um, Jeff has uh, now franchises in addition to DreamWorks, including uh, Fast and Furious, where we were talking about Vin Diesel just before we came up here, and, and the magic of marrying Vin and the rest of that fantastic cast uh, to, to Fast and Furious has created this extraordinary global franchise and now creating another one where our client Tom Cruise is working with our client Alex Kurtzman in the monster universe. That's the next great franchise up. And Les and I have talked before, and I think we work with maybe half of Les's primetime schedule of shows that we've packaged, and James Corden and Late Night and broadcasters and sports broadcasters. So really what it is is it, it, it's a hit-driven universe. It's a, it's a world in which the, the best content is, the, is what is going to matter most, and great talent creates that content. So the question then is, for DreamWorks Animation and Universal, why did a deal happen now? Why did it make sense for, for this purchase to happen now? And do you think there will be more similar deals in the works for whatever content assets are left? I mean, Lionsgate, Stars, et cetera. They called. <laughs> <laughs> um, why now? That's true. They called and they made a very, very compelling offer. There were a lot of synergies in terms of the combination of our two businesses that allowed them to pay a very good price for uh, what we do. And ultimately, we're stewards of our shareholders and we had to do what was right for our shareholders. Why now? Because the industry is in a time of great uh, consolidation and change. And we're watching it in real time. I saw Bob Iger on a panel 
um, last year, and he said more change had happened in the last few years than his entire experience in the media business. And he, really, I thought that was saying a lot. Um, so I think it's because of the rapid change that's going on, and I think everyone recognizes we actually don't know what this will completely look like in the next decade. And so, again, when those rare assets exist, be it Lucasfilm or be it uh, DreamWorks, I think uh, smart companies like Comcast say they won't be around for very long unless you know, we make, take our shot. Someone else will take their shot. Jeff, plenty of people have compared this acquisition to what Iger has done, you know, building and buying brands to exploit across multiple platforms. What, what was behind the, this decision? Well, I'll say I, I agree with everything Melody said. I, I think the one thing I would say is the flip side of the benefits of, uh, of the globalization and the digitalization content is that there's lots and lots of stuff to watch, right? And so even if you have the best show or movie, you have to get it out there. You have to somehow fight through the clutter and, and, and find a way for people to discover it and, and see it. And I think, frankly, DreamWorks was, as a small independent company, was really missing that kind of fire hose of promotion that we, as a big company with lots of different assets, can, can focus on, you know, focus on a, a show or a film to really make it successful. And so for us, you know, what we missed, we didn't have an animated TV business. Now we have, you know, when the deal closes, you know, we will have a great animated TV business that they built. Um, and we have this ability to promote things like you'll see with the Olympics this, this summer on NBC where we just for 17 days, you're just gonna see this, this giant promotion of an event and, and a family film from DreamWorks is an event that now we can, we can promote our company behind. So I think I've heard a lot of talk about valuation. I like to say you know, both, both stocks went up when we did the deal. So clearly investors thought there was a win-win for everybody. And I think at Comcast, we just believe that the asset is unique, that we can make it better um, and that, uh, and that it, for us, some of it was buy versus build. As Richard said, it's hard to find good talent and good stories, and sometimes it's, it's, it's better to acquire them for a price that makes sense for, for your company. And if I could just add one other thing, I think from the DreamWorks side, when it was Comcast, we said, we literally, we went through all the possibilities, and we said, this company belongs here. When you think about the theme park opportunity to exploit, exploit the IP that we have and some of the theme park, ex, theme park expansion that they have, when you think about the distribution uh, synergies that exist there with, with Universal, when you think about the scale that we would get out of consumer products, which had been an area that we'd really been trying to grow and have a couple of properties that are coming very soon that have tremendous consumer property opportunity like Trolls, um, we just said that at the end of the day, going it alone probably isn't smart, that we really should give this company the opportunity to really thrive inside of a company that has that kind of scale and that kind of global reach. So in terms of doing what was best for the company, not to mention the shareholders in terms of valuation, we really did believe, and I said this to Brian Roberts directly, Comcast was the place where, was the place where we should be. So do you think we're gonna see more M&A in the space? Are you gonna buy Lionsgate or Stars? <laughs> not not, you right not now. this week, not this week. <laughs> no, as an outsider commenting, when, when this deal happened between DreamWorks and, and, and NBC Universal and Comcast, it was one of those deals that you said, of course. It just, it just made a lot of sense. It sort of came out of left field, but not really, and it sort of fit, and uh, I concur with everything they said. Look, the, the power of size and quality certainly matters. Uh, DreamWorks with a quality brand, the power of, of Comcast behind it certainly will enhance it. Do we look at things? All the time we look at things. We're hungry to do more. Um, we feel like we're a company about to explode and we need more assets to do it with. But once again, it's got to be the right asset at the right price for us. We're, we're uh, very economical about what we do. That's, uh, you know, our job is to make money. Um, and uh, if there's a, a, an available property, we'd go get it. There are a couple of available properties. Yeah, yeah but the price and the quality may not be the same as DreamWorks was. Okay, how's that? Fair enough, right. fair enough. Okay, <laughs> stars and lines go, uh, we will see. Um, so I, I guess a question about this deal, you know, DreamWorks Animation had a big presence in China, and Jeffrey Kazenberg had spent a lot of time there building up a, a real presence there in partnerships with the Chinese government. Was that appealing to Universal? Absolutely. I mean, on a variety of levels, um, 
if you look at the theatrical business, just start with the theatrical business, the, the theatrical business in the US is pretty stable. The growth is all Latin America and Asia. And people, by the way, talk about China. It's not just China. The rest of Southeast Asia, Indonesia, if you look at Vietnam, a market that has like 100 screens, there's a lot of growth in Asia. And it's up to us where we're really going to see the growth in our business is going to be in the Asian market. In China, we didn't even have a single employee there two years ago. Now we have a uh, distribution outlet. And the reality is it's not just the brands and what they mean here at DreamWorks, but these are brands that resonate across the world. They're global brands. You know, Kung Fu Panda is as much an Asian brand as it is a domestic brand. And a kid who watches Madagascar enjoys it as much in the US as they enjoy it in, in, in Australia or Vietnam or, or India. And so yes, absolutely the globalization of this business and the work that Jeffrey and, and Melody, the team, have done in making this a global brand was incredibly uh, attractive to us. I want to pull up slide number one, which shows the international share of global box office receipts and how it is growing dramatically. I don't know if we can pull up that slide. I see. Oh, there we go. Um, just to have that in the background during this conversation. Um, you have, CA has had a presence in China for a while, and I was surprised to learn that you have a presence in China representing Chinese talent for Chinese production. So it's not about even bringing those actors in, into US productions. Tell well, me about it's, that. It's about that as well. We've been in China uh, for more than 10 years, and uh, we, we started in the marketplace uh, with the idea of working with local talent and also being able to run interference for clients who wanted to work in China as well. So um, this past weekend, uh, I believe the number three box office movie in the world was a movie called Finding Mr. Right 2, because um, uh, apparently they didn't find Mr. Right in one. <laughs> and uh, we represented the director, the, the writer, and the star. Uh, of the film, um, and and so that's a that's something that we've been doing for a long time. We signed a, a playwright yesterday, who's one of China's most beloved playwrights and, and, and directors. Uh, uh, we we uh, represent probably, arguably, the five most important uh, Asian filmmakers, including Zhang Yimou, who's doing uh, the, the Great Wall, which is one of the the big awesome. interesting films that that Jeff's involved with. Uh, that that is. Is, is going to be one I think everyone will pay a great deal of uh, attention to. And we, we ran interference when Will Smith was producing Karate Kid in China, there we were, and Mission Impossible for Tom Cruise in China, there we were. We're raising film uh, funds. We, we, we've closed two $150 million uh, financing uh, vehicles uh, that are, are pretty exciting. I think we've announced them both. I'm not 100% sure. <laughs> Um, and with plenty more activity in China taking place right now. So, I mean, obviously CAA started off as a U.S.-based business, focused on the U.S. entertainment business, which was, of course, exported, but really about Hollywood here in the U.S. How much of your business is now overseas, and how much of your business is outside traditional Hollywood? Um, well, uh, in terms of outside traditional Hollywood, we're, 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 we're very well known uh, as being talent agents, but. The, the truth is that, the, that having started in sports uh, just 10 years ago, and that was from a, 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 having absolutely no involvement with the sports business, brick by brick, piece by piece, over the last 10 years, we've built what is now in North America, the, 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 the biggest powerhouse in, in, in sports. I checked with my guys to make sure I could say that, and they said it was OK, <laughs> that, uh, that it was, in fact, the leading North American sports uh, uh, business. Um, and it's now the, the, the largest revenue stream in the company. Sports is. More so than movies, television, and, and music. And that's just in the last 10 years. And I think that sports is one of the ways in which our company is moving very rapidly uh, <laughs> in, in, uh, into the uh, global community uh, with activity in Germany and in, in the UK. Uh, we're in China. We're doing things like representing UEFA for their uh, global media rights and with sports sponsorship and from, from that to uh, a company we just acquired is called Icon, uh, run by a fellow named Tim Romani, who is an owner's rep in managing venue in the building of venues or restoration. And uh, his, his group prior to being with us built the O2 Arena in London and is building the new AC Roma uh, facility in Rome. And that, that international business is organically growing for us, bit by bit, connected to all of the things that we're already doing. So sports is a key way to globalize and diversify yeah, this. Yeah, without, without, without a doubt. Now, Melody, I think it's important to point out that you're not just 
chair of the board of DreamWorks Animation, but you're also an investor in a number of media companies. How important is the global piece as you evaluate the media story? Well, one, we're a big investor in CBS and have been since uh, the financial crisis and have made a lot since, of money. Since we were $4 a share, $4. Ariel was an early investor and a loyal investor, and <laughs> fortunately, it's paid off for them. We They've backed up great. the truck, and we made a lot of money, <laughs> thank goodness, um, because we had a lot of faith in you. Um, I would say that globalization is a big part of the story. We've bought into this idea that American, in, American entertainment exports globally. So I've seen it on the one hand on the DreamWorks side, and just speaking of China with DreamWorks, we see that as a great land of opportunity. Jeffrey was telling me, Jeffrey Katzenberg, that uh, he has gone to China every month for five years. Bracking up a lot of frequent flyer miles. Yeah. So, I mean, it does or make For Jeffrey's it's, private jet yeah. miles. Je I Jeffrey's, no, he was Je on Jeffrey's also bored all yeah. the time. He so was on commercial flying to <laughs> China, I can tell you that. Um, but I would say that uh, that has been a land of opportunity for us, and we set up a joint venture where we have a minority interest in Oriental DreamWorks with the Chinese having the majority interest, and we actually did that on purpose. We said, if we win, they win bigger, so ultimately over the long term, it builds hopefully a very um, good relationship. And obviously Kung Fu Panda became a real um, linchpin to that relationship because the movie resonated so strongly. Uh, in China. And, and I don't know if the audience is aware, but you did a local language version. You didn't just dub. I mean, explain how it was different. Well, in we China. actually do local language versions in most of our films. Um, but so. there was something, I think there was something different about, I mean, because oftentimes with these animated films, they're just redubbed, but you did additional content to really. And we also make that. used, in our most recent Kung Fu Panda, we had um, parts of the movie actually made there in China. So that was something that it, it was a part of mm -hmm. uh, the production. Uh, but when you ask about Ariel's investments, which have been extensive in media for the last two decades, not only CBS, but Viacom, and Gannett, and Tegna, and Meredith, and uh, Madison Square Garden uh, Network, I mean, I could go on and on in terms of the media names that we've owned. We have bought into this idea of globalization. We do believe, as I said before, the American content does export in a unique way around the world. It does resonate, and it does work not only our jokes, but also our dramas, and as well as our sports, clearly. And so as a result of that, we've seen that as a huge opportunity, as I think many have seen. And I would say one other thing about it, I'm going back and forth between Ariel and DreamWorks, but on the DreamWorks side, we've been able to play globalization, not only through the distribution of our own films, but riding along with organizations like Netflix as they expand around the globe and go from fewer countries to many countries, um, that creates an opportunity for us, especially with television. No, that, that, that's, yeah. a, that's, that's a key, what Melody was talking about. And to understand the globalization, specifically of television, which I'm much more familiar with than, than, than anything else, you have to look back at what happened domestically. So you start out with broadcasting, expands into cable, then expands digitally, and the world's changed. And suddenly you have Netflix and Amazon and Hulu buying our content, putting it on digitally, sort of changing the whole syndication business. So our content is exported in a similar way. Initially it was broadcast, and then there were more players. And now you look in a specific market. So we take a piece of content from CBS, NCIS, The Good Wife. You go into a territory like Germany. There are now 18 buyers in Germany. The Netflix, the, the Amazons are there as well, plus the local SVOD players. As a result of this, seven or eight years ago, our, our global revenue is about $500 million. This year, it's $1.6 billion. In seven or eight years, it's tripled, and that's because competition has grown. And in addition, the world has grown. We're obviously now in Eastern Europe, we're in Latin America much stronger, and of course, as we've been talking about, Asia is now becoming a serious player. And do you expect that international growth to accelerate? Absolutely. It's continuing to accelerate. There are more and more deals, there are more and more ways to do business. And once again, in a digital marketplace, the sky's the limit. Jeff, I, I'm curious for you to weigh in here. Obviously now you're in the film business, but your background was television and you were based in London for many years. You have an interesting thesis about how film is actually following the path that television took. Yeah, so first of all, the interesting thing about the film business, just look at this chart, is people love to use box office. Box office is a terrible measure. It's almost like using ratings in television, right? Because it doesn't tell you anything about profitability. There's different, in, in China, you put a, a movie in China, 
you get 25 cents on the dollar in profitability. Right. There's no home entertainment market. You know, there's no free television business. And so you're way less profitable. SVOD is starting in China. That is really promising. But you got to kind of look at the different markets. You know, my, I actually believe, and, and, and not just because he's sitting next year, I think Les actually figured out the international TV business before most other people. And, and I know that you do your international guys see your shows before your domestic guys see your shows. Yep. And, and I think what's happened is, if you look at the TV business, and tell me, if, tell me if I'm wrong on this, but you started with a bunch of shows produced in, in the United States, pumped around the world. Then you got to the place where you were, you were actually making shows that would appeal across the world. Then you got into the format business. If you look at formats around the world, you have popular shows in the US that are now exported to other places in formats where you reproduce the show in a local version. And now what's happening, you're sourcing formats around the world. So Homeland started in Israel, reproduced in, in the US. The film business, I think, is about 10 years behind the TV business going in the same trajectories, right? So it used to be you make films in Hollywood and you send them around the world and you make, make some money. And now what you're doing is you're producing films around the world. We Fast and Furious is the second week of shooting in Cuba. Uh, first motion picture to shoot in Cuba since, since the 20s. Um, but the reality is we make most movies outside of the United States now in, in London and Asia and parts of the world. Um, I think the movie business is going to fast go into the format business where people are going to start remaking popular movies in other places around the world. And then what you're going to get to is the really exciting time where you're going to have a lot of markets around the world where movies can, can make their money back just in the local market, whether net China certainly can do that now, um, Brazil and, and parts of Europe. And then those movies can have formats that come back to the US, and those stories can be retold in a domestic format. So I actually think, in a weird way, the TV business has kind of blazed the trail for the film business. And if their profitability is any factor, we, it should be a really good time to be in the motion picture business. And so do you think when these films are being remade in local markets, it's going to be universal who's going to be making them, or is it going to be more of a, a licensing arrangement? I don't think it'll be licensing, but it may not be universal. We're a studio, so we, we make films and we buy films, and it's going to depend on the market. Um, you know, you, you always want local filmmakers. Talent ends up being the key. Richard's exactly right. So however you can get the best talent, whether they make it for somebody else and you distribute it and buy it, or whether you actually fund the production, it's going to depend on the market and it's going to depend on the filmmaker. Underlying this conversation about globalization is this idea of diverse voices and diverse storytelling. Um, and it seems like that's a key to success as well. Yeah. I, th I mean, I think, I think when you get global, diversity starts to get multidimensional and starts to get very, very tricky. But I, I, I actually think the key to diversity is going to be making movies that appeal to our audience, which is already diverse. If you look at the audience in the United States and all, all, all markets, if you want to be successful, you better have movies or television shows that appeal to your audience. And they also better not be gratuitous. They, also, they better be real and real characters and real stories doing real things. And I think that's going to be incredibly important, not just in the US, but around the world. And Richard, I know this idea of diversity um, it, from a Hollywood standpoint, the production standpoint, is something you think about a lot. Yeah, we do. Uh, th there was an appropriate outpouring of attention paid recently in terms of the absence of diversity and, and uh, statistics numbers in terms of number of, uh, of, of uh, diverse voices uh, telling stories and, and having opportunities. That is something that we've been working on for many, many years. Melody has been an extraordinary advisor to our company for, I don't know, uh, six, seven, eight years. Um, and, and we've worked very, very hard in order to, to nurture uh, uh, the, the, the greatest number of voices who are going to speak to an audience that's in increasingly interested in being reflected in the movies and television shows that they watch and, uh, and further around the world. So it's a, it's a really important issue and a great opportunity for everybody, a real opportunity to increase the quality of the stories that we tell with more voices, more storytellers having the opportunity to express themselves. And I think it's another reason for amazing optimism in terms of the kinds of stories and, and in ki kinds of entertainment we're going to enjoy. I also think it comes down to common sense as well as uh, dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, the industry will quickly start to realize it's in their own best interest for that diversity to shine through. The example that I would give you is when we did the movie Home, which had Rihanna as our protagonist and J-Lo as her mother, Jennifer Lopez in the movie. And at the time, first of all, it was probably the first mixed race character in terms of the idea was that 
Rihanna, whose name was Tip in the movie for her real name was Gratuity. And I said, with a name like Gratuity, she had to be black. <laughs> um, so Tip was half black and half Hispanic. I can say that. Yeah. And she, um, and we had a tremendous amount of feedback from uh, mothers uh, who really were quite thrilled to see a character that looked like their children all the way down to the curly hair. But on top of that, Rihanna's social network following is staggering, you know, truly staggering. So when she started to really not only tweet about the movie, but also just constantly engage her, um, her followers in what she was doing, it, we, we are convinced it made a difference in terms of the box office for that film. So it makes you much more excited about that opportunity on a going forward basis. I think Netflix has also figured out that that's going to be a key to what they're doing with film and television, because they're giving lots of filmmakers opportunities who heretofore probably wouldn't be making movies. And they make it very clear, these aren't tent poles. Uh, these are, are medium sized to smaller movies that like Beasts of No Nation, that maybe would not ever make it to the big screen, and yet they're incredibly well done and incredibly powerful stories, and they're willing to take the risk with that. And they can do that because of the subscription model that they have and the way that it plays out as those, those films go out across the world. You know, I was, I was reminded of how small the world is, the, the size of the impact of, of what are the stories that are told here that go out around the world. This morning I was in a meeting with a client who's, who's an African client who is working on a, a, a new broadcast platform in Africa that we are working on with him. And anecdotally, he said he'd just been in Nigeria and a young boy had said to him, uh, apropos of whatever it was that they were talking about, did you see Will Smith talking like a Nigerian because of his accent and concussion? And you hear that story and, and you're reminded, oh my gosh, these, the, these messages are being heard by everyone around the world having profound impact and changing lives and inspiring people and inspiring other storytellers and acknowledging where people live and how they live and who they are in a way that's very, very powerful. And again, in that, I see tremendous opportunity. No, to, to Melody's point, you've got to speak to your audience. You've got to speak when, when you see diversity, when you see the amount of Hispanics growing in the United States. Not to speak to them not only is wrong, but it's stupid as a businessman. <laughs> right. it, it really is, not to reach out to that audience. And, and by the way, television hasn't been great. It's doing a lot better, and there's been considerable strides, and, and God bless Shonda for, for doing what she's done. Um, but we all have to do a better job of that. And, you, and I think also the other thing, you tie it back to globalization, there's an assumption that's, that, that certain kinds of stories that have not worked in the past won't work in the future. And that is just completely false. Straight out of Compton, if we hadn't had an assumption of international that was kind of unprecedented, we never would have gotten to a number to make that movie. And the reality is it beat the number internationally by a, you know, 2x or 3x what we thought it would. So the world is changing too. And you can't assume that what's happened in the past economically is going to happen in the, in the future. And just to tie back to your comments about Netflix, I think it's interesting. It sounds like you're very bullish on Netflix, but you said you're not an investor in Netflix. Why are you so optimistic about the potential of this new, this new platform? I actually am. The reason we're not an investor is because we buy value, so we want to buy stocks when they're out of favor. So I don't wish ill on them, but I would be excited about them if they had a few really bad quarters, <laughs> and then we can go in and buy. Um, but I would say that yeah, in their spending, stocks down a little bit. Lately. Yeah, but not well, enough. A uh, little bit. <laughs> we need to get to the, the kind of four dollar CVS level to get excited. I don't think they're going there. Like, but, right. But it was a great opportunity to buy. What I would say that. Um, that said, notwithstanding the fact that, again, from a value manager's perspective, that doesn't meet our criteria. There are a lot of other managers who would buy that stock and ultimately profit from it. But I would say that uh, in looking at their business model and spending time with them and having them really explain what they're doing, I was convinced. And I was convinced about the nominal fee, basically, that someone pays around the world to be able to have access to all of that content and how as they grow around the world, it gives them the ability to take more risks. And not only take more risks with certain types of movies and certain types of television, but take more risks with certain types of, of, of ways that they are, are presenting it to their audiences. And so as a result of that, just the, 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 the economics for them of their filmmaking is just very, very different, again, than that tentpole kind of movie that costs 
$250 million plus $150 million in, in uh, prints and ads. And you know, it's just a different math. And the math just appeared to be much more compelling to me. And the world is thirsty, hungry for this content. And so if you can you know, do all of that the way that they've done it, and I think a lot of filmmakers like the quiet of how they don't have to deal with the box office numbers and they don't have to deal with the ratings. What about Amazon, now that Amazon's also a player in both tel television and movies? Obviously much smaller player, but meaningful and clearly came out very strong with House of Cards and some of the things, other things that they've done, so they can't be discounted in any way. Um, I think it just makes it, uh, at the end of the day, it actually creates more opportunity. You know, th there's this always this sense that more competition is bad, and sometimes more competition just continues to make the, moral, the world more aware of what the opportunity is. And so you see that all the time. That's why McDonald's goes across the street from Burger King or whatever it is. It's that they lift each other in the process. And so I think um, in many ways, even though Netflix has the first mover advantage, I think Amazon, and I was, I have to say, I was skeptical on Amazon. I really was because I was, I was of the belief that it's literally trying to be all things to all people. And yet, I think they very click, clearly pick the areas where they think that they can succeed. And then they've just gone full on in those areas. And when you look at how it ties together, it actually makes sense. What does this mean for your clients? For, for our clients, to, to echo what Melody said, it's just more opportunity. Right. And uh, we just, we just uh, had a very, very interesting situation with a decision to make on what was a spec script. In other words, uh, it was an available piece of material that was controlled entirely by the filmmakers that uh, came together with a group of our clients, David Ayer, uh, who uh, is reteaming with Will Smith. They just made Suicide Squad, and they're going to make a movie with Joel Edgerton co-starring with Will, the movie called Bright, and the competitive environment were two major studios and Netflix. And Netflix was offering uh, a great deal more money uh, on a guaranteed basis, uh, but in addition to that, so there was, a, there was a, an uneven playing field in terms of the economics, more money with which to make the movie and produce the film, as well as money for, for, the, for the clients. Um, but it, it, they're, they're able to give them entire, all their freedom, autonomy to make the film as, as they wish. Uh, it's global day and date, um, and without, without box office pressures that are uh, those that people wake up to, uh, or actually leave Friday night with and wake up to on Saturday morning. And it, it becomes a very interesting discussion and purists may, may argue one side of it, and, and nobody's more invested than we are in preserving the theatrical uh, experience. And here was another alternative and a different way to make the movie that the filmmakers chose uh, to pursue, and it'll be an interesting uh, process to watch. But are you, or I'm sorry. I was gonna say autonomy is overrated. <laughs> and, and I mean that. I mean, there, there is a certain thing where Netflix says, here's $100 million and you're never gonna hear from us. Go make your movie. I'd like to think, as a television executive, as a creative executive, that we add something to the process. I help cast friends. I was an executive. I no. don't, people don't know that. It's not important. We help the process. Executives at the studio, at the network, they can make things better. Yeah, I, 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 better. I, I really, I'm, I don't want to offend Les at all, because right. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> uh, believe me, I don't. It, it's up I, I was, season, Rich. I was, I, I'm about to pick my new schedule, so be careful. <laughs> and, I, believe me, uh, it's the, this is now, a, this is a disaster for me. But, uh, but, but no, but the truth is that, uh, that this is a collaborative art. It is. Uh, right. It, right. Telling stories, it, it, yes. it, whatever the content length is, whether movies, television, long form, short form, it's a collaborative art. And great, whether it's a great executive, a great producer, the input of anybody in that group, anyone who makes films and television will tell you, uh, best voices ought to win, best ideas ought to win, and, and there are many in a room. So, so yes, it, it, autonomy is not a, a tiebreaker if you have great input. But there's another question about the decisions that you're making with your clients. When they have all these new options, there are a lot of questions about whether going to a Netflix or an Amazon is undermining the ecosystem that they so rely on. If they have a choice between being on FX or Bravo or going to one of these digital players, 
if they're going to the digital player, is that going to be one piece of a bigger force that is driving cord cutting or cord nevering or cord slimming or whatever we're calling it? Given what just happened, I really want to know what Les wants me to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. But, but, um, but do, you, do you have a conversation? You're, you're about, on your own, pal. Do you have a conversation with some of your bigger <laughs> clients? If you, if you have someone with a show, do you have to say, OK, let's think about this. Is going to the digital player to the new guy in town, will we make more money now? But does that mean that we're going to be pushing you know, the end of a cable channel that might have been valuable to us? I, I, I don't think that the, I don't think that the talent bears the responsibility for the, the ecosystem, as it were. And I think Netflix, Amazon, and all of the emerging <laughs> Uh, players who are creating content, financing content, and distributing content um, are going to win or lose based on their own creative decisions and whether they make the right choices uh, in, in, in what they choose to uh, produce and the way that they uh, market and distribute the, the, the shows or... No, or that, that, that's absolutely right. In other words, th there's often a piece <laughs> of material. <laughs> okay, I'm going to unplug yeah. now. <laughs> You're okay for now. <laughs> James Corden will be on next year. <laughs> no more questions. Um, no, Netflix offers when we'll compete with Netflix for a show on Showtime, or it could be CBS, and there are very different models for them. Netflix offers a guarantee of 13 shows. You get them all on the air at once. There's a certain amount of profit. They'll generally spend a bit more money on the product than we will. Um, there's not as much an upside often on the back end. And it's a different value proposition. By the way, I think the Netflix and the Amazons are great for the ecosystem. I really do. I think the more product, the better off we are. And competition does, as you said. It does spur you on to do better work. Uh, Netflix clearly is producing now, I think, 35 original television shows. So they are a direct competitor to Showtime. And that's OK. Showtime's doing fine. Bring it on. But it's a different value proposition. But you've also taken a very sense. unique well, I'm sorry. Yeah. I was going to say, I just also think it assumes that it's a zero-sum game, and I just don't see it that way at all. Correct. And certainly that has not been what we have found at DreamWorks, or even when we look at the, the media holdings that we have. You have to assume that, uh, I think there's this idea that the Netflix and the Amazons of the world become disruptors that lead to a fragmentation that ultimately devalues all of those assets. Les has given examples of where that just is not the case in terms of their global revenues, et cetera. But also you can see it in terms of, you know, the story was first there was radio, then came television, and that was going to kill radio. Well, we still listen to the radio. And we listen to the radio, some people are listening to Pandora, and some people are still looking at listening to FN and AM. Then there was the internet, and that was going to completely destroy television. Well, we're watching more television than ever in some ways, but at the same time, we're, we're spending a lot of time on our computers. And so somehow, the, 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 it wasn't a, a, a choice. People are doing both. And maybe different ages are doing different things, but it's still serving, th these various uh, constructs are still serving people very well when it comes to entertainment. And so now you have digital. And so it would, again, assume that they would destroy these other opportunities. And we just don't see it that way. It's just another way that the content will be um, shown. The other thing which I think we know firsthand, and I know a lot of people on this stage know from their own experiences, and this is, again, speaking from the DreamWorks side, there are not a lot of great ideas. You know, it's not as if there's an abundance of brilliant storytellers out there, and they're just a dime a dozen. You know, hit shows are hits for a reason because the other ones aren't. And hit movies are hit movies for the same reason. And because the, the really brilliant ideas are so rare, it ultimately does make those brilliant ideas more valuable. And so those people will get paid who have them or that talent that is a great actor or whatever it might be. And we saw that played out in your earnings. The surprise, and you, you commented on this, was despite the rise of digital advertising, people are actually coming back to old-fashioned television. Yeah, digital advertising is very important, and it's obviously the future. But there was an interesting statistic that 85% of digital advertising is either on Facebook or Google. So there's a lot of advertising there, and a lot of our advertisers went to digital. And in certain cases, only certain cases, it wasn't all it was cracked up to be. The return on their investment was not as deep or as bonding as it may be with network television. So we like to say digital advertising is great, but you can't reach 20 million people 
like you can by one episode of The Big Bang Theory on YouTube so easily. It takes a lot of hits to do that. But interestingly, in terms of your digital distribution strategy, you have taken a different path than some of the other media companies. The other three media giants teamed up on Hulu. You very much wanted to go it alone, and now you have sort of a family of direct-to-consumer apps. Can Correct. you tell us about your subscriber Correct. numbers? No, look, we, we, people receive our content in three different ways domestically. Initially, there's the 180-channel bundle where you pay $100 a month and you get CBS along with 179 channels. The only problem with that is people are really only using 15 of those channels. So now you have the evolution of what's called the skinny bundle, which is becoming more and more prevalent. And you're hearing more and more noise about it. And then finally, the last step is a la carte, which is CBS All Access. So for $5.99 a month, you go direct to consumer. You can get every episode of every CBS show ever made, including what's on today, all the way back to I Love Lucy. And then we're going to begin to produce original content with our Star Trek series, which is going on in January. It's right. <laughs> We love those Trekkies out there. You know? Yeah. <laughs> once again, once again, may I add, it's a CAA package. You know, it's, uh, you know, which we're happy to say. So, so it's a different way to reach our consumers in any way you want us. We're there. Now, the movie industry, obviously, you have distribution through all these digital platforms as well. But you're in a different situation with the Windows. What so I, I was going to pile on a Richard, but he was struggling there for a little bit. Oh, so oh I wasn't pile, on, pile on, pile <laughs> on. No, I, I, I actually think it's the, it is a complicated thing, these ecosystems, right? And it's easy to say, you know, that this benefits this or this benefits that. But the reality is there's a lot of complexity in how these things are built up. And I, I, think, net, I think the one thing that's true is more buyers are good, right? So as you make content around the world, Netflix does not have the dominant share that it does in the US, and so you have what Les described, which is five, six, seven buyers, and, and in most markets around the world, it's this frothy market of buyers, which is great for makers of TV and great for makers of, uh, of films. In the US, you have, they are in a position, which is one reason why Amazon's a great thing and Hulu's a great thing, to have other, other buyers. The problem is there, is, there are these ecosystems built on both ends. One is an ecosystem where you get reach, which generates advertising, which helps lower the price for consumers of, of certain content, and that's good. And if that breaks apart, that may not have great you know, results. We'll see. And then on the other side, you have the film ecosystem that's been built up for years and years, where you put your movies in a movie theater, which filmmakers want to see their movies up on a big screen with great sound. And then you sell DVDs, and then you put them on TV networks. And, and the problem is that, that you have a, you have a bunch of consumers now, particularly younger, who don't necessarily always want to go to the movie theater and are used to seeing things on their iPad or their phone and don't understand why they have to wait and do this, so they pirate it sometimes or, or forget about it. And then the problem with, with filmmakers going to Netflix, just to disagree with Richard a little bit, is it may be good for that filmmaker on that movie to say, I'll take the $100 million or the guarantee and the autonomy and all that. But the reality is, to a consumer, once you pay your subscription fee, psychologically, you think it's free. You don't, you don't think you're paying for that movie. You think, you know, when you pay for your cable and I go home and watch the Dodgers tonight, I didn't pay for that Dodger game. I paid for my cable package and the Dodgers came with it. And I think the problem that, that, that filmmakers and talent and agents and all of us have to think about is there is a long-term complexity to all these models. And if we really want to maximize the value of things, A, we have to get the consumer what they want. That's key. B, we have to have a lot of buyers, and, and C, you have to think about things over the long term as opposed to just that individual decision, that economic decision. So it does worry me when filmmakers go to Netflix and make a movie for Netflix, even though I love Netflix as a partner and a buyer, and I love Netflix as a consumer, right? But it does worry me to see filmmakers on one level go to Netflix and sell their movie, and on the other hand, talk about the sanctity of the theatrical experience and you know, all that. I think we have to, we have to sort that out. So speaking of the sanctity of the theatrical experience, you have this other question of people wanting to watch things at home opening weekend. And ideas out there like Sean Parker's Screening Room, which is a, a service that would allow people to watch at home and collapse the window between when a movie's in theaters and when a movie's available at home. What's the future of that? It's really complicated. So I, I give you know, AMC a lot of credit for trying something with Screening Room. Whether that one works or not, you know, we'll see. There's lots of complexities around pricing and product and all that. I do think that there is a tension in the movie business 
between the old traditional model that's driven it for decades and a, a, an increasing share of consumers that will just not go to the movie theater very often. And, have, and, and it's not a decision between do I go out to dinner or do I go to the movies? It's a, increasingly a decision of do I stay home and watch Netflix or do I go to the movies? And when I was growing up, it used to be you started at Channel 2 and you surfed up the dial and eventually maybe you get to you know, Showtime and you watch something there or you get to USA and you watch something there. And movies were something that you wanted to buy for those services because you would channel surf your way sometimes to a great movie that you wanted to see or you hadn't seen or that you loved. And the, the, the fear I have right now in the ecosystem is that people aren't, you know, particularly younger people are watching, you watch Billions to the end, you watch Game of Thrones to the end, and you don't have an opportunity to really get movies as part of that rotation. And if we're not careful in the movie business and we don't offer consumers something that they want at home on the device they want in the right way, we're gonna lose that consumer. And, and I do think something's gotta change in Windows. I don't know if it's screening room and I don't know it's very complicated, we have to get there in the right way, but something's gotta change. So if I could just add one point on this from two perspectives. One is from a board's perspective where we watch movies in our board meetings on a regular basis. And also from the perspective of being married to a filmmaker. So in both situations, uh, there is an experience that is very different when you watch a movie with very few people or alone versus in a crowd. And it meaningfully changes the experience of the film, meaningfully. So when you watch in a group with lots of people in a full theater, I often find that I like the movie better because you get the crowd's reactions around you that help influence, even if it's subconsciously, how you think about the film. And filmmakers will tell you they want that experience to be a communal experience. So my husband would tell you that uh, he, he would very much want his films to be watched with lots of people because the jokes and all sorts of things, it becomes infectious if you have someone else around you. And so because of that, he continues to believe that movies will always be a social endeavor and people will go to movie theaters, but they will be more expensive experiences and the theaters will have to be nicer. I think what hurt was movie theaters became very crummy for a while. And we were walking around with the sticky floor and the you know, bags of popcorn that were sitting all over from the movie before us. And as a result of that, it just wasn't a great experience. Well, now as some of these uh, movie theaters have become really swanky, and you, know, you can adjust your chair and get your food at your seat and all of those things, it's gone back to being a much better, quote, date night experience. And then when you have that social aspect of other people there, that's great as well. So the last thing he would say, we watched Beast of No Nation at home. And he said uh, he loved the movie. Loved it. I mean, loved it so much, he's like, look up the filmmaker right now. I want to find out who made this movie. And he said, because it's really hard movie to make. He's like, jungle and kids, hard. <laughs> he's like, they walk for long periods of time carrying equipment in the jungle, really hard. <laughs> and he said, but this movie should be watched on a giant screen so you can appreciate the vastness of what they were doing. And secondly, in the middle of the film, we had to stop watching it for a little while and come back to it. He's like, we have done this movie such a disservice by turning it off, even if it was for 20 minutes, because that's not how a movie is supposed to be watched. And as a filmmaker, he's like, that is not what we want. And we would prefer you to be in a big theater where the only thing you might do is go to the bathroom, as opposed to take a break from the film and come back to it later and really not watch it through to its entirety. But, I, so. but Melody, I'd like my daughter to stop texting at dinner. That doesn't mean she's <laughs> going to, right? That's the problem. Like, I, I think we, I think, I totally agree with you that films are better. Comedies are better, horror films are better, big tentpole films, the films your husband make are absolutely meant to be watched with a group on a big screen. There's a whole generation growing up that just doesn't do that. No, and, nice I'm, not dis I'm not disagreeing yeah. with you. I'm just saying I think there are, both worlds will exist. Yeah. And I really do. I and agree I think with that. that the social yeah. aspect of it is something people need things to do. I mean, they really you do. Leave your house. I mean, yeah. it's not, you know, going out and having something to do is not insignificant in no, the world. No, staying home and watching television is a very good thing. <laughs> You don't have to go out. <laughs> we are almost out of time, but I'm just curious. You mentioned sort of this binge viewing thing, which is which has changed the way people watch and create television. And we've seen it. You mentioned it with Billions, which I binge watched. Um, and I wonder if that has affected filmmaking. I mean, we've always seen this trend towards sequels, but are you making 
movies, even we were saying we have Captain America opening this weekend, that's part of the series of Avengers films. I mean, do you think of filmmaking as more of a storytelling arc that's over the, the course of several films because that's be how people watch television? Yeah, I, I personally think, I, I kind of laugh when I, coming from TV, I laugh when I hear people say, oh God, you know, I'm sick of all these sequels and you know, there's, filmmakers aren't doing original stuff anymore. And then they go home and watch the next, next episode of Billions or Game of Thrones and not, don't complain that, oh, yet another episode of Game <laughs> of Thrones, right? <laughs> you know, you, when you create great characters and great stories, people by nature want to see what happened to those characters and those stories. And great story arcs are the, are the key to the history of television and movies. And there's nothing wrong if you watch 13 episodes, if you binge watch 13 episodes of House of Cards and then wait a year and watch 13 episodes of House of Cards again the next season, there's not all that much different between watching you know, Fast and Furious 6 and waiting a year or two and watching Fast and Furious 7. It's seeing another chapter in what happens to characters that you love and environments that you love. So I think there's nothing wrong with that. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'm so sad because I could keep on going with this panel for another <laughs> hour. But content is still king, and uh, story arcs, um, whether it's on television or movies, still matter. Thank you all so much for joining us. I really appreciate it.